Now it is time to introduce our first panel of the day, and that is the Medical Advocacy Panel. So first we have Dr. Trevor Hawkins, who is a board-certified neurologist and assistant professor at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus with subspecialty expertise in movement disorders. He provides treatment and care for patients with Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's Plus syndromes, Lewy body disease, and many more. He currently sees patients at UC Health at the Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora, the Denver VA Medical Center, and is working to develop the Movement Disorders Telehealth Network through UC Health. Dr. Hawkins is also on PAR's Medical Advisory Board and enjoys community outreach by presenting at our Parkinson's 101 for newly diagnosed and our chat with a Parkinson Pro. Elizabeth Harmon has been working in general neurology in Colorado Springs since graduating from the CHA PA program in 2011. While she cares for patients across the full spectrum of neurological diagnoses, her special interests include Parkinson's disease, deep brain stimulation, neuroplasticity, and the effects of CPTSD on brain development and organization. She is on the Medical Advisory Board for the Parkinson Association of the Rockies and remains active in PA education through precepting, guest lecturing, and curriculum development. Carrie Friedman, who is our licensed clinical social worker, has been with PAR since 1999. So she wins the award for the longest employee ever. It's amazing. Um, Carrie is the Patient and Family Services Director and works with constituents and their families when newly diagnosed, have a change in their health status, and when something urgent happens to them. In addition to being with PAR, Carrie worked with the University of Colorado Outpatient Neurology and Palliative Care Team for 14 years, and recently she transitioned to private practice for people dealing with chronic illnesses, but her passion is helping those in the Parkinson's community. Erica DeMarsh, who has her master's in physical therapy, is a physical therapist with over 20 years of clinical expertise and is the founder and CEO of Step and Connect, a company dedicated to improving balance and reducing falls with innovative devices and educational programs. She invented the patented Balance Matters system to offer a fun, functional, and science-backed approach to training balance. She has a passion for learning and teaching. Within her local community, Erica teaches balance workshops and group exercise classes for individuals with Parkinson's and older adults. Erica is also on PAR's Medical Advisory Board. So with that, give a warm welcome to our panel. So the way that we did this is we asked for input from the community um, on some questions that we could ask our panel. And we had quite a number of responses. And so we tried to group them into categories. So our first category is, is communication with my medical team. And there's really two questions around this that I think all of you will have good answers to. So the first question is, how do I get my medical team to communicate with each other, especially when my medications are conflicting with each other? And the second is, if my doctors and therapists aren't communicating with each other, how can I approach that? So Dr. Hawkins, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll actually let Beth start first with that question. Oh, OK. Um, so one of the things that I love when my patients do is when they let me know if something has come up between their appointments. So um, if all your medical providers are within the same healthcare system, the communication is actually relatively smooth most of the time, but we all know that that's not true for everything. So your physical therapist may be outside of the network that your Parkinson's specialist medical provider is working in. And if something comes up in that appointment, sometimes we don't know about it. So I love when patients message me through the patient portal or when they give our office a call and tell me, you know what, some, you don't have to know all the lingo necessarily, but my ophthalmologist had this concern or someone else came up with some question and let me know ahead of time, because oftentimes I can just get the medical records, and then it's very clear what the situation is. And sometimes I don't get those records before your appointment unless you tell me. We like to think that faxing thing everywhere is very efficient and we all get the records we need, um, and we know in reality that does not always happen. And so I, I love if we have two sides working on it. If, if the provider you just saw says they will fax it to my office, and then my medical records person also requests it. Um, then we pretty much know we're going to have all the information that we need either prior to your appointment, if something needs to change sooner, or that we can discuss everything at the time of your appointment. So that would be, don't feel like you're bugging us. If there is a concern or you just mess say, you know, my physical therapist had this question, could you contact them? Or something like that. I, I always appreciate more communication rather than less. 
That way we make sure that we can deal with things as promptly as possible or we're as best prepared for your appointment as possible rather than in the moment at your appointment than having to say, well, I'll go find all this stuff and I'll call you back later. Um, so definitely let us know if something has changed. Let us know if something comes up. If you have access to a patient portal and feel comfortable using it, I prefer that personally because there's fewer people handling it in the middle. So sometimes you get the game of telephone and by the time we get the message, it may not have all the details in it anymore. So if you feel comfortable using that form of communication, I think that's always probably the smoothest and make sure that we get as much information from you as possible. What she said. <laughs> um, yeah, and just to kind of reiterate a few points here, she talked a lot about, you know, from outside providers communicating back to us, but it goes both ways too. Mm -hmm. So. One thing that I like to try to do for my patients is if I have a question to give out to the community, whether it's a physical therapist, cardiologist, whoever, I type that question verbatim in their after visit summary so that you guys have a sheet of paper or notes on your phone that you can pull up directly when you're meeting with that other provider. Because I think you know, Beth kind of hit the nail on the head. Honestly, the buck stops with you as the individual. You're the one that needs to communicate with both sides of the street. Yeah, so if you kind of use that intentional redundancy, where one aspect is us talking behind the scenes, but the other aspect is you talking to both of us directly. Yeah, so I usually try to put the direct question, talk about this medication or talk about changing this medication or this medication, whatever the situation might be. And I encourage you and I try to empower you for you guys to try to get that understanding from not only us, but from any of the other providers as well. What is that question? What is the concern? So you guys understand it in your terms and then that way we can have that direct communication with us, so talking about what Beth said and highlighting, taking advantage of those electronic um, messaging systems works really, really well. It cuts out a lot of that, that need to have to be physically available to touch base over the phone or that game of telephone that inevitably happens when you're trying to send messages throughout different routes. Plus it gives a hard copy about what the questions are. So that can be very easily forwarded to other providers as necessary. I just had three messages yesterday that patients accidentally sent to their primary care that they just then forwarded directly to me verbatim the same exact question that they asked the primary care provider. Now, so that works really well. So I encourage you, if you have kids, grandkids, nephews, nieces, family members, if you're not necessarily tech savvy, have them try to set it up for you. And I can speak from personal experience. This is what I do for my family members that aren't tech savvy. I help them communicate using those electronic systems. And I think it really helps kind of cut out those middlemen to inform those conversations. Yeah, and I would say too that a lot of people are afraid to tell their doctor, ask questions to their doctor and our PA, whoever, and are embarrassed about some of the questions they wanna ask. I would say that the doctors, the PAs, the nurses, the PTs, OTs, speech, they've all heard those things and um, that they're there to help you. So don't be embarrassed. Um, and sometimes when you type it in, you don't have to actually talk to the person. So, yeah. And I, I really, really try to be direct of what your concerns are. I have so many clients who come to me who want to say something, but they're not sure. If it's something that you find is important, we want to hear it. So be able to really say, you know what, I want the doctor to be able to talk to the PT because of X, Y, and Z. So really, whatever is important to you, we do want to hear. Um, I also find communication works better within the team when people know each other. So if you are an outside provider, or you have a PT who doesn't know the doctor, introduce and, say, and tell the doctor or tell the therapist, hey, I really like this doctor. I've been working with them you should meet, or the more you get to know each other, it's an easier communication so that I can find out that this doctor likes communication this way, somebody else likes communication other, another um, way so that I can communicate with that doctor better. So I think really um, introduce if, and then it's also better for referrals. If I have somebody who asks me which doctor should I see and I know that doctor's approach, it's easier for me to tell that client, you know, see this doctor or that doctor. So. Um, introduce, you know, we, we're all here to help you out, so definitely introduce um, your team to your other team members um, would be one recommendation. Another, I would also look at logging some of your symptoms. So sometimes if you can then send that to your whole uh, medical team, if it's pain, fatigue, or whatever you're doing, if you have that log and you can bring it, we all kind of can see what's going on because we all have a different perspective of what we're looking at. And on that same token of kind of like documentation, one thing that I find is very helpful from a patient or caregiver perspective is keeping a list of who your provider team is with contact information. 
And in that way, if you're meeting with another provider and they say, I'd love to be able to get a hold of your physical therapist, you have that information handy with you in your notes to be able to pass that along. That just cuts out one more step of potential breakdown of trying to get that communication to occur. Perfect, all right, thank you. So the second category is really around preparing for a doctor's appointment. So for all four of you, what are the top three items you like to see in an appointment? And is there a difference between what a care partner should bring into a meeting versus the person with Parkinson's? Yeah, so excellent. So I think kind of starting off a little bit on what Erica was just talking about, I think the, one of the most helpful things is before you're meeting with your, you know, especially from the neurologist point of view or, or your other care providers, is really sitting down and thinking to yourselves, what are those big ticket items? What's important to you? And I think there's kind of two ways to approach that. Of course, hopefully some of those things are relatively self-evident. What are those things that are bothering you? And don't necessarily have to make a value judgment either to say, well, this doctor cares about this, but this one doesn't. We want to hear about it. We want to hear what those are. Because many times we might have a unique perspective that isn't exactly obvious in, in terms of how it might relate back to Parkinson's, for example. But the other part is that there's many resources out there through PAR, through the Parkinson's Foundation, other websites too, they have a lot of great resources that give you kind of a, a menu, a list of possibilities of symptoms in Parkinson's. And it's not a bad way to kind of sit down and look, that, look over that and then kind of categorize with it if you're noticing any of those bothersome symptoms in your own individual cases. And I say with, with redundancy too that the caregiver can also do that same reflection about what they're seeing as well. And I do strongly kind of encourage bringing caregivers to your appointments because what we, what we know for sure in Parkinson's, there's kind of two very important experiences that help us improve the quality of life. One is the experience from the individual with Parkinson's but the other is the eyewitness point of view. There's many symptoms that um, that combination, hearing from both sources, is how we put the pieces together to really fully understand the situation. And honestly, the more minds that are thinking about you, the better. Um, so I do think that's always helpful. And if a caregiver can't make it to an appointment, um, they can be available by phone or to be able to contact, or if they even provide a list. I have some patients where well, their caregivers will jot down notes, and then they can be passed on to the visit as well. And then next, kind of following along that same token, having an updated list of your medications and other treatments and providers is also really helpful. And what we need to know is not necessarily what's prescribed, but what are you doing? Because we know that there always are some, some uh, um, accidental mistakes where doses get missed all the time and those kinds of things that can happen, or you guys have made changes on your own. Um, but so we really need to know about that, and it's helpful if you sit down before, because otherwise sometimes we spend half the visit of like basically playing detective of what is the actual medications and how they're being taken and not really getting to focus on you and what the issues that matter. So if you're able to do a little bit of that homework ahead of time and come in with, with that information prepared, that helps us kind of jump right into the visit. And then Beth mentioned earlier, the other thing too is if things happen in between visits or even before a new visit, you know, reaching out to us to let us know that so we can obtain the records, obtain imaging, testing, whatever might have been done beforehand. So then we can give you a more comprehensive review of that and kind of make the next steps as opposed to the next step being at the end of the visit of gathering that information to then kind of kick the can down the road. Awesome. Are you guys able to hear in the back a little bit better? Great. I've never been accused of being too quiet, so this is weird for me. Um, one thing that I would draw attention to that I find is really helpful, and this is specifically as with advancing of Parkinson's, but it's a good habit to get into early on, is if you have a symptom, a side effect, uh, either or, you're not really sure, um, it is incredibly helpful from a prescriber perspective to know the patterns of when that is happening. Um, we all know that the medications we use to treat Parkinson's unfortunately do not create even control throughout the day, and so we tend to have this up and down effect throughout the day. So knowing morning or night, when my meds are kicking in, when my meds are at their peak, when my meds are wearing off, Knowing when the symptoms are happening is incredibly helpful from our perspective for figuring out what's going on, um, especially as your treatment becomes more complex. So let's say we add deep brain stimulation on top of your medications. We now have two entirely different things that we're looking at that we're trying to sort out. If you're getting dystonia, is it your stimulation? Is it that your meds are wearing off? What is the situation? So if we can look at the pattern and you can tell me, you know what, it's the last 45 minutes before I take my next dose of medicine almost every time, or it starts at 2 p.m. in the afternoon and I don't feel good again until I wake up in the morning. Uh, whatever that pattern is, that is really helpful for us 
in trying to create a medication regimen that is specific for you as opposed to just a generic Parkinson's medication regimen. If, if we don't know, ideally we would have even control throughout the day and that wouldn't be so much of a problem, but we all know that's not the case. So um, that really for me is a, is a huge help in terms of reducing the amount of just trial and error that we're doing and really being able to target what is specifically gonna be most helpful to you. So for a physical therapy um, perspective, the first thing, you know, my job is to help improve your quality of life. So I really want to know what your goals are. So what is your personal goals? What's important to you? Is it hiking? Is it golf? Is it going out to the theater? Because that's going to help understand more of what type of exercise plan and what we will be doing. So what are your individual goals and what do you want to be able to achieve or keep on doing is the first thing that I ask every client that walks in the door. So kind of really thinking about that. I, you know, I'm a balance expert. People say I want to improve balance. Well, who cares? You could stand on one foot for a long time. What is that helping you do? So I want to know what, if you want to improve balance, but it's balance to do what? Um, and that will be a lot more customized and personalized for your, um, your plan. Number two is what are you li what's limiting you to achieve this? Do you have any barriers? So is it pain? Is it fatigue? Do you think there's something that's going to stop you from achieving that? Is it depression or apathy? Because that helps me as a um, healthcare professional also know what I can do, but maybe refer you to other um, clinicians. So maybe seeing a neuropsychologist, if you think it cognitive, you can't follow the directions of an exercise. What is it that is limiting you and what other maybe referrals you need or what we need to do to decrease those barriers? And then number three is similar to um, is what is your day like? So what is your typical day? So we only see you for like that smidge of your day, right? We're evaluating you in one environment at one point of time. So first, looking at the time, okay? Again, you know, do you change? Your mobility might change at different times of the day, but then also different environments. So maybe in a closed space or something tight versus something open, does that change your mobility? dark versus, you know, you're at a theater on a slope trying to get to your seat in the dark, does that change your balance and your mobility versus a bright lit, um, lit room? So really looking at different environmental um, constraints and then also looking at time and then also time constraints. So I lived in New York City and I had clients tell me, I have to go across the, you know, I have to get that traffic light and I want to get to that um, restaurant and I only have walking problems when I feel rushed. So we want to know all those different parts of your life because that's going to be a lot more customized for your program. That's great. So can you all hear me? Because some didn't hear me in the back. Can you hear me okay? Talk louder? Okay. So, um, so social work, we do different things. And one of the big ones is resources. So a lot of times I like to talk to them, how much do you need help in the home Do you, um, for the care partner? Do you need some help for someone to, to give... Um, meals or do different things like that and also advocate for to see their doctor are they having a hard time getting into doctor's appointments i know some different companies they're um three four or five months down the road where they can get in so i can advocate for you to try to help you get in sooner um there also um we i run two facilitate two support groups an evening support group that meets every wednesday night on zoom and also I do a care partner support group that meets the second and fourth Monday of the month at two in the afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me. And so there's also the part of sadness. I mean, there's a lot, most people, you're all doing great. And, um, but there's sometimes when you're down and you're allowed to have pity parties and then you get back up. And so I can help you when you're having a, a problem with that. So. Um, help you to re rejuvenate and have a great quality of life. That's what palliative care is, and that's what I really try to do, is and like um, to help you to to go on with your life, you know. And for care partners, and I like to say care partners because you help each other out. Is that um, sometimes it's hard, and like Dr. Hawkins was saying, that there's there could be two different perspectives of what's going on. So I like to talk to you. Um, individually, and then also we, you can meet me over at the Parkinson's Association, or we can Zoom if it's too far. 
um, to see what's going on with each of you, your perspectives. So know there's also the emotional piece too with Parkinson's because anxiety and depression are pretty prominent in people with Parkinson's. And so we want to help you with that to make it so that your life is as good as possible. Okay, thank you. So this next question, um, Carrie and Erica, I'll have you answer this one, is when do I utilize a social worker and a physical therapist, and what resources do you each provide? Okay, so um, you can utilize a social worker from right when you're diagnosed. Um, and I recommend that, and Erica will say too, that um, you should meet with PT, OT, and speech right when you're diagnosed so you have a baseline. And, um, and social work too, to help you navigate. Um, it can be an advocate for you and navigate through the system. Um, most of the time, people do very well. There's just that one bit of time where you don't have a good, you're having a hard time with Parkinson's. So I can help you. Um, it, as things move along, and Parkinson's is a progressive condition, but so too is research and science. So remember that that it that as much as it can and it can start slowly and progress slowly, and or for some people it'll be a little quicker. And so um, know that there's research out there, and um, that you're well taken care of. So I agree that the sooner the better to have your team and to meet with the OT, PT, speech, social worker, neuropsych, whatever your team is to be able to get a baseline measure. Um, I love, I, I have asked so many dentists, how do we have the six month dental model that we get a baseline, we get our x-rays, get everything checked out. Even if we're feeling fine, right? We still want that baseline to make sure everything's okay. And best case scenario, we say you're doing great, see you in six months. Um, same with other um, for PT. But you know what, sometimes you know, a cavity is forming, right? We didn't even know that it was forming. So the same with if you go to a specialist, we could see something that might cause a bigger problem if it's not addressed. So if we address it sooner, then we're able to do something. Um, and then the same thing, then we can, um, if there is a problem, then we develop that plan. So sometimes you might see a therapist a little bit more um, based on whatever we find. Other times we'll say, hey, you're doing great, go to the community, or maybe we'll just tell you a little, tweak your program just a little bit. You know what, your posture's changing, we might just need to add this exercise that you're not doing. So really having that specialist to see um, what you're doing. Um, again, I'm gonna talk about balance a little bit more because that is my specialty. So many people tell me I'm not falling, my balance is fine. Why do I need to do that? The research supports if you, the sooner you do something, even if you don't have a balance problem, that you're gonna do better. So including that into your program and having a therapist kind of see maybe some things that you need to work on. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to the fourth question. And Dr. Hawkins and Beth, I think the two of you will take this one. Are there benchmark symptoms that I should be watching for as my disease progresses? <clears throat> Yeah, so I think there's an important point, to, and Carrie kind of mentioned it already a little bit. The key thing to keep in mind is that every individual with Parkinson's is unique. Everyone's a snowflake, no two exactly are alike. So your progression, your journey, the symptoms you experience is going to be unique to you. That's where it's really important to establish those longitudinal relationships with your therapist, with your social workers, with your neurologist, with your primary care providers, everyone. Because that's going to give us the best idea about how to understand how you're progressing and where you're at in the course of the disease, is watching you over time and seeing how things are changing. To give you another little perspective, you guys may be familiar or heard about different staging of Parkinson's, the most common one being the honing yar, kind of a stage one through stage five. That one is really designed and built to be used on populations of patients, so hundreds or thousands of patients simultaneously, where basically you can kind of see patterns or more often than not, certain symptoms will show up more in advance versus early stages. But when you try to boil that down to you as the individual, there's a lot of errors that get made. So essentially, to give you one example of that, stage four for that honing yar is using walking assistive devices. But let's say you're using a walking assistive device not because you're Parkinson's, but because you got in a bad car accident and your ankle's really busted up. Yeah, so that can already tell you that because you have a symptom of needing to use the assistive devices, it really gives you a false sense of where you're at in terms of the staging of Parkinson's. And the bottom line that like we just talked about is that the symptoms are unique. So symptoms are possibilities, not inevitabilities of Parkinson's. 
So I, that's also crucial to remember that if you have a symptom, it really does not directly mean that you're at a certain stage of the disease, okay? So that's where it really is important to have that kind of unique perspective from you and your individual care team. Now on that same token, what are some of those benchmarks though to keep your eyes out for? And, what, and when you hit them, what do you wanna do about in those situations? Well, one key one, and, and, and Beth kind of already highlighted this a little bit, the idea that early on in the disease course, and I hope many of you are still there, you can kind of do whatever you want. You can still kind of push through your symptoms, you can kind of miss doses of your medications, try a bunch of things and everything kind of works. But inevitably, and there's one study in Australia that looked at this that said about 20 years into the disease course, pretty much everyone reaches that point where you start to have those fluctuations. Those periods of time when you're on and everything's working really good, combined with that roller coaster juxtaposed with those times where you're off and you lose functionality. You can no longer function to your best ability when you are off. So now those stakes get higher. And we refer to that as more the advanced stage of the disease, where you can't kind of get away with doing whatever you want. You have to be a little bit more specific about what you're trying to accomplish. And that's a great time that if you haven't had the opportunity to get into a movement disorder expert, to get into a Parkinson's clinic, because that's where we have a lot of tools in our toolkit, like deep brain stimulation and different medications and different types of therapies that we can use. But the stakes are higher and you don't have the luxury of doing a lot of trial and error to kind of keep maintaining your quality of life. You can't kind of cross over those potholes that got New York City size now. You, can't, you gotta make sure that you're not bottoming out. And so it's important to recognize and, and make sure that you're kind of getting that expertise on board to help decide kind of what, when and where and what to try next. Now, the other thing that, that Carrie kind of mentioned too is it's important to kind of always be prepared um, through par throughout Parkinson's because unfortunately, the majority of patients, it's not inevitable, but the majority will also experience at some point in the disease where they kind of lose the ability to fully take care of themselves. That's why it's important to identify care partners and include them along the journey. It's also important to recognize that you know, being prepared for those situations, whether it's a combination of mental or physical things, but have kind of that rainy day plan, kind of start asking those questions and talking it through. And that's where also, not in addition to social work, palliative care and supportive care clinics, there's many different resources that are out there to start kind of thinking about those scenarios and asking those questions. So you're not caught scrambling when, when those symptoms do start to occur. Now you already have a plan in action. And it's also important to kind of follow with your care team to identify if any of those kinds of situations are starting to emerge. To have conversations early and often about what to do as those kind of uh, care situations start to come into the, into the picture. I would just add a couple examples of what some of those advancing symptoms might be. Um, and I, as healthcare providers, we were probably like the worst at overthinking in, in hypochondriacs ever. So um, we, we, at any rate, so I know this is like way easier said than done, but having a sense of what the, um, what the options are of symptoms that could happen in the context of Parkinson's. So if you look at a list of Parkinson's symptoms, it's going to be overwhelming and look terrible, um, but no person with Parkinson's is going to get every single symptom on that list. It is, so it's easy to look at that and that to be overwhelming and say, oh my gosh, this is what my life is gonna look like in 15 years, this is horrendous. Um, and it's really hard to not go down that road, so that's the easier said than done bit. Um, but if you know what the landscape could look like, then you know what to look out for so that you can tell us. So, for example, if someone starts developing difficulty with swallowing, I don't know that, and, that people would inherently say, oh, that's a Parkinson's thing, right? They might see their GI doctor or something like that. Um, those are the types of things that are really important for us to know and we should be asking for, but if you can come in and say, you know what, I think I'm seeing things that aren't there, am I going crazy? You're not. Um, but that's something that may not intuitively be a Parkinson's symptom. So making yourself aware of what those things can be, number one, so you don't think you're going crazy because you're not, um, number two, so that we can address them or get you to the right area earlier. Um, it's good to have the knowledge and then hopefully try to not then sit and, and use that knowledge to worry because again, everyone is different. But I do think it's helpful if you don't know, if you're having something strange going on and you have no idea if it's Parkinson's related or not, we of course would rather you bring it up than not tell us. But some of those categories, cognitive, autonomic symptoms, so GI issues, um, swallowing problems, uh, blood pressure control, temperature regulation, um, and then we talked about the motor fluctuations as well. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to Dr. Hawkins. You mentioned toward advanced stages seeing a movement disorder specialist, and I just want to make sure that everyone in the room understands the difference between a movement disorder specialist and a neurologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent question. And I think um, there's even other providers outside of neurology who certainly have a lot of expertise in Parkinson's as well, so I would include like our geri geriatrician colleagues, many of which um, are very familiar and have many patients that they might have come across with Parkinson's. But what's the big difference between kind of a general neurologist or a geriatrician versus a movement disorder expert? We basically spent extra years training specifically to manage and help our patients with Parkinson's disease. So that provides us a luxury because we've seen all the weird. We've seen all the goofy stuff that comes up. We've seen all the different paths that it can go down. And so that allows us to kind of be able to provide that guidance and expertise no matter what kind of a situation that comes up, we've seen it before, and we've probably seen it ad nauseum. And we really get to focus on all those kind of little nuances, all the nooks and crannies of Parkinson's disease that can come up and provide and, and fill in the gaps for those kinds of things. Now, it also allows us to kind of stay up to date with kind of the latest and greatest as well as far as different research and different modalities of treatments. Um, and again, we get to use those um, during the clinical trials and then provide them into direct clinical experience. And so that allows us, again, to kind of share that direct you know, experience with our patients that come to see us. And so sometimes it, I think it's important to kind of juxtapose that to just the, the regular care that you're getting as far as uh, the excellent care from your general neurologist and other care team, who are certainly going to be more than capable of addressing your symptoms and needs, but may not be aware of the kind of the full menu or may not have seen the goofy stuff before. They may ask us questions many times that kind of weigh in on, well, I'm kind of running into the, not the usual situation here. But I think it's also nice that if you've already had that established relationship with a movement expert, kind of get the roadmap, so to speak, I think that can provide additional information and then kind of take back to your general neurologist so you guys kind of learn together. Just speaking from the general neurology perspective real quick, I absolutely am happy to, but I don't, we don't get our egos involved. So. Um, if I have a patient that is seeing a movement disorder specialist, which is wonderful, we don't have any in my community in Colorado Springs, and so I have a lot of patients that have travel limitations, and so maybe they will see their movement disorder specialist once a year, once every six months, and then I help to implement that plan in the interim. So if I have patients that are working with a movement disorder specialist, I'm not gonna sit there and fight with that person's plan of care, right? I'm going to partner with that too if something's kind of come up in the middle that we might need to mess with things a little bit, or, um, you have questions that maybe, you know, want to talk about further, but I'm going to take the role of supporting that plan um, and helping to fill in the gap. Maybe if the access to seeing the movement disorder specialist on a regular basis may be limited based on transportation or things like that. Perfect. Thank you for that, Beth. Um, Jody, I'd like to add also just a little yeah, bit that, so there's also specialists for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. So. You can't hear me, and I usually am louder, too. There we go. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. Um, so I also, and there's different resources to look for that because they also have extensive training, um, different resources, look at research differently. Um, and we'll also, same thing, you want to have that team member. I sometimes will do the assessment and just look at things maybe a little differently, but then work with the trainer or tell them some other things to work with. So you could still collaborate, even if one specialist is looking at it. It doesn't need to be like, I need to see this person, but I like this therapist. Like, we should all be working together. Um, so just know that um, we're here to help you, um, and no ego should be involved. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent point, Erica. Um, the next question is for all four of you, and Carrie's touched on this a little bit. Um, a registrant asked, I'm not comfortable talking about my diseases, even with my provider's help. How do I do that? I'll start with that one. Um, you know, so people will confide in me and they're afraid to talk to their doctor about what's going on. So personal issues, so intimacy issues, they're afraid to talk about that. They're afraid to talk about bowel and bladder issues because, you know, we're taught when we're young that we don't ever talk about things below the belt. Those are your private parts, right? So we don't think about having to share that with our doctor. So sometimes what I do is I, have, I role play with people and have them talk to me asking the questions so they'll feel safer talking to their doctor. And I wanted to piggyback from the last question. If your ne general neurologist has a problem with you seeing a movement disorder specialist, you find a new neurologist because they are, we are a team that works together. 
And you could take that information like tra Dr. Hawkins was saying and take it back to your general neurologist or you keep going. So, um, so that is one thing that I wanted to talk about. And then also when people say help, you know, a lot of times people are afraid because in today's times, the way healthcare is that doctors have to see three patients in a time slot. So to make sure you're prepared when you go in to talk to them and don't be afraid. Like I said earlier, it's really important to, to lay it out there because as Dr. Hawkins said, he's heard a lot. And for them, for the people, for you guys, it's the first time for you. So you think, gosh, they haven't heard that. Well, they have heard a lot of stuff, but for you, it's unique. So remember that, um, that they're there for you. They care about you. And if they wouldn't be doing this if they didn't like what they did, so. Um, so the same thing, I, I think um, I, one part was maybe even some people say for, and for balance or for strength, like you don't want that something to be taken away from you. We're here to help you for more. So I think that's the biggest thing that sometimes people are afraid to tell me that they fell or something happened. And they'll tell me that a little bit later where if I actually knew that happened, I can actually develop a good action plan so it doesn't happen again. So we're the same thing. We're here to help you and figure out what we can do. Um, versus finding out some information later because you were uncomfortable. But the same thing, I've role played with some of my clients to talk to their doctors. Um, it, it's a, we really want to hear exactly what you're feeling. I just wanted to stand in solidarity. It's weird, right? You're potentially revealing something to someone you barely know that maybe you haven't told your family about, right? Like that's a weird dynamic. Um, it's normal to us. But then if I put myself on the patient side of my own healthcare, I feel the same way. So um, they don't feel bad about that. Just, it's normal, it's normal. Um, the more that we know about what's going on in your life and what matters to you, the better we can treat you as one person living with Parkinson's and not a stereotype Parkinson's patient. Um, so I think there's the concern that, oh, this is embarrassing, or oh, this makes me look weak, or it's personal, or I'm terrified that this means my Parkinson's is progressing and I don't want you to say that, right? I, I, don't, I don't want to admit that I've had four falls in the last week because that's admitting that things are changing. The more that we know, the more we can, can address those situations. So um, as weird as it feels, we are not here to judge you. We did not go into this field to judge you. Um, the more that I know about my patients as individuals and know what their priorities and their values are, the more I can respect those in my treatment plan and the more that we can be a team. So I never want to dictate to someone what they're going to do. I want to help create a treatment plan that everyone is comfortable with and that everyone understands. And the more that I understand your priorities and your concerns and your life limitations, right? If you are really struggling to take your medication consistently four times a day, I can tell you the importance of that till the cows come home, and that's maybe not the problem, right? The problem may be that there's all, there's, you're afraid that if you get up to go grab your pills, you're gonna fall, and so that's why you're not taking it. That is a fully different issue than just not taking medication. So um, the more that we understand, the better we can tailor our time and we can tailor our treatment to the things that really matter to you. Yeah, I think everyone said it so excellently so before. And to kind of summarize, the standard of care for Parkinson's is shared decision making. So that is absolutely the most important detail. And so that means sharing the back and forth between the provider and the patient. It's not, we don't go off lab work and anything else like that. We're going off of you, the individual, in terms of making those treatment choices. And I, like Carrie said to you, honestly, you can't gross us out, you can't surprise us, you can't embarrass us. Unfortunately, we've seen it all before um, and then some. So we try to kind of, it is a truly safe space. It's protected. We're not sharing your information. You have privacy laws to protect you as far as that goes. Um, but again, 100% understand where it can be very uncomfortable to talk about these things. So just sharing a couple different things that I've seen over the years as, as far as how patients have kind of come out from that. Number one is time. Is that developing that relationship, developing that trust with the provider, it's not, it might be difficult those first couple of visits, but hopefully if you kind of stick with it and get to know them, you'll be a little bit more comfortable kind of opening up about those topics. The other part is I've had, definitely had patients where they'll, they actually feel more comfortable with their caregiver, or care partner, excuse me, Carrie, yeah, and <laughs> their care partners being able to deliver that information. So they feel more comfortable talking about it with them as opposed to them having to be the ones directly kind of bringing it up. 
Um, because I think that sometimes it's a little bit easier to kind of share your thoughts when you're comfortable than having someone speak on your behalf. Yeah. And so that's certainly something that we're more than capable. And also vice versa. Sometimes it goes the other way where you're comfortable sharing with your physician or your, t or your care provider, but you might not be comfortable sharing in, in front of your family members or your care partners. So I have many patients, and we offer many times, and Carrie alluded to this too, where she'll have direct conversations intentionally with both the care partners and the individuals separately. Because I think sometimes that's, that does come up where you're much more willing to share it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if, you're, if you want to make sure that happens, we talked a little bit earlier about shooting messages through the, the, the patient portals and those kinds of things. is a great way to kind of send an anonymous message or anonymous to the rest of the, the family, per se, or care partners to let us know, hey, at our next visit, you know, do you mind if, if you can excuse the, uh, everyone else in the room so we can have some one-on-one -on -one time together? Now, I've had some patients do that, too. Um, so again, the idea is create that situation and where you're able to feel comfortable. And if you're not feeling comfortable, if you're not feeling heard, like, like, like Carrie was mentioning before, that might tell you that maybe the therapeutic relationship isn't there with that individual provider. And that might be time to kind of seek out a, a second opinion or another option. And the other thing too is like we talked a little bit about having kind of your care team. So that's also very, very true where sometimes you might feel very comfortable talking with one provider and sharing those details and not others. I think the important thing is that you can also mention to them, would you mind sharing that with my other providers, if there's, if there's something actionable like with that? For example, bowel and bladder issues being shared with the urologist or some of those kinds of concerns. Because um, again, you might find people that you really click with and really trust, and any of us would be willing to kind of fill that role for you to advocate if you trusted us with that information to be able to share that with, with the other medical providers. All right, that is excellent advice. Um, Beth, I want to ask you a quick follow-up question before we move on to the last question. You talked about utilizing your local neurologist, and we know that in Colorado, there's a lot of areas that do not have access to a movement specialist. Um, so can you talk a little bit how to utilize that local neurologist or to access a neurologist when living remotely? So I would say the advantage to having a local neurologist well, twofold. Number one, um, we all love the advent of, well, love or don't love, but we, we now have telehealth, um, for good or for bad. Um, and good, you can access someone remotely, right? So you can live in Wyoming and you can, I think, see movement is a specialist in Denver. Um, that's a wonderful thing. But you're also looking at a condition that is kind of hard to evaluate over telehealth, right? We can't really evaluate rigidity. We can look at bradykinesia and we can look at walking, but there's limitations to what we can see for movement disorders over telehealth. So having someone locally that can really examine you and pass that information along to the movement disorder specialist is great. Um, I also have a lot of patients who don't just have one neurologic condition. Right? So you've had a stroke, and you have Parkinson's, and you have peripheral neuropathy, and you have other things going on. And so the movement disorder specialist is going to really focus on the movement disorder. Having a, I guess, the neur neurologic equivalent of a primary care provider, right? Someone who's kind of looking at the big picture of your neurologic status is not a bad thing. Um, someone who, you know, you said, eh, I've got this numbness and tingling, and your movement disorder specialist said, nah, not your Parkinson's. Um, someone who can take a look at that as well. So I would say that's an advantage. I think we oftentimes make the diagnosis more often than not, unless something is one of the tricky forms of Parkinsonism that aren't as common. Oftentimes the diagnosis is made by your local neurologist. Um, and so that's access to that initial care. If, if you're having symptoms and, and your primary care provider's concerned or you have a family history and you're concerned that you may be having it as well, that might, might be faster, <laughs> might be a faster way of getting in and a more direct way of being evaluated. And again, our egos are not involved. So um, having, having the ability if you live remotely or if the access by the movement disorder specialist, they're busy enough that they can't see patients as frequently as may be needed, uh, having that ability to go back and forth is really great. Is that? Thank you. Yeah, no, that was perfect. Um, and in our little bit of remaining time, the last question I'm going to have Dr. Hawkins and Erica respond to, but how do you find research opportunities that are reliable and credible? Wonderful question. Um, and again, events like this and the Parks Association of the Rockies and other foundations, the Parks Disease Foundation, Michael J. Fox, and there's many others, are excellent resources to kind of have some of that value judgment put into what are good quality research studies and potential opportunities. I think one thing to always keep in mind 
you do not need to be an established patient somewhere to participate in clinical research too. Um, so a good example is for us at University of Colorado with our, with our trials and, and the other various uh, trial centers that are across Denver and Colorado. You can reach out to us if you're specifically interested in research projects. So we have all, a lot of us have booths here today, but also checking out those websites, seeing what kind of comes through, yeah, and asking questions. And the other part of that too is asking questions to your providers. This is where having a movement disorder expert, I think also is, is a nice piece of the puzzle because many of us are kind of involved with these studies or up to date, so it's a great resource. I have plenty of patients, probably at least 10% of my messages are about, what about this research study? What about this one? Should I participate? Should I fly across the country for this one? All those are perfectly what I want to be helping my patients um, uh, answer in terms of what they can kind of prioritize. And unfortunately, the other part of that is there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I do, I do think it's very important when you guys are hearing about research studies to always trust but then verify. Because unfortunately, sometimes they make it sound too good to be true. Um, and that's where definitely having your Parkinson's experts, can, like, uh, like having a movement disorder neurologist or the equivalent, can be really useful in terms of kind of sorting through that information. Um, the other part, too, is that if you're ever kind of wondering just in general, what's kind of the master list is the clinicaltrials.gov website, and you can actually search through that as far as looking for Parkinson's or if you have specific symptoms of Parkinson's. That's kind of the default. So anything that's kind of fully registered in the United States will kind of be listed through there. Yeah, or even sometimes internationally. So that's not a bad place to look. But if you're looking for local opportunities, again, check out Park Association Rockies, the different academic or research centers. Get that information and then periodically check the sites because they'll be listing all the information about upcoming research studies. Can I interject for just a sec? Uh, I get calls almost every week from people that they read something or they saw something on the news about this study that is going to cure Parkinson's. And a lot of times the studies there have just 10 to 12 participants. So it's not that big of um, a sample in order to make a diagnosis. So I understand that you want, you're desperate to get answers, but talk to your provider about the study because 10 to 12 people really isn't going to work for folks. And on that note, there's different phases, right, of a study. So looking at, you know, if you look at even at CU, the SPARC um, trial that looked at, you know, the intensity of exercise that started here, which is really cool. Now they're at phase three and there's 29 sites around the country doing that study. So really looking to see at what phase, you know, we need an idea to start to do it. So sometimes, and then going to that next part, but um, exactly what Dr. Um, Hawkins said is you're look, I look at academia a lot. So there's two PT schools right here in Colorado that have um, Regis or CU. So they have a lot of studies. So looking at more of the foundations or the um, academia is a good place to at least start. All right, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank our panel. Yeah, go ahead and clap. 